Billie Jean King, who changed sports and America with her stand for equal pay, joins us for a conversation on the past, present, and future of women's sports. Plus, a jury ruled that the NFL owes Sunday ticket users over $4 billion. The NWSL is having its best season yet. The golf streaming partner shut down, and you'll be able to get Olympics highlights from AI Al Michaels. It's Friday, June 28th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. It's time for your top of the morning headlines brought to you by Wendy's. The Wendy's new $3 English muffin deal includes a bacon, egg, and cheese or sausage, egg, and cheese English muffin sandwich plus a small side of seasoned breakfast potatoes. That is a proper meal and it's just $3 for a limited time. A jury ruled that the NFL owes NFL Sunday ticket users $4.7 billion and bar owners $96 million in the NFL Sunday ticket antitrust case. Federal law allows for the total punishment to be triple the damages awarded meaning the league could be on the hook for over $14 billion. The NFL and its media partners were accused of raising the price of the out-of-market games package well beyond what it would be in a competitive market. The league said it has every intention of appealing the decision, which could eventually make its way up to the Supreme Court. We will have more on this on Monday's episode with Andrew Brandt. The NWSL welcomed its one millionth fan exactly halfway through its 182-game season. That's the fastest it has hit that benchmark. Heading into its 14th week, the league has an average game attendance of 11,089, which is the highest of any women's soccer league in the world. NWSL stars will be on the international stage in a month, with 14 of the 18 players on the U.S. women's national team currently playing in the league. Caffeine TV, the little-known streaming partner of Live Golf, has shut down. Caffeine was funded by the Murdoch family and venture capitalist firm Andreessen Horowitz, but said simply it was not making enough money and was opting to cease operations. Caffeine focused on small to mid-sized sports leagues such as the World Surfing League, FIBA, the X Games, and World Poker Tour. The former Prime Minister of Georgia, Bidzina Ivanishvili, has pledged $11 million to the players and coaches of the nation's national team after it upset Portugal 2-0 in the European Championship. The former PM said he would do it again if Georgia can defeat Spain on Sunday. He can afford it. Forbes estimates his wealth at just under $5 billion. And NBC is offering a feature on Peacock that will provide 10-minute highlight packages that can include event recaps, player backstories, and more, which users can customize and will be narrated by Al Michaels, or actually by a computer that sounds a lot like Al Michaels. The broadcasting legend is lending his voice to an AI system that will narrate the highlights. Michaels was convinced the software would do him justice after listening to a demonstration. He will be paid for the use of his voice, which is an important detail to some of us. This segment is sponsored by Gainbridge. I am now joined by the one and only Billie Jean King. Welcome, Billie. Hi, Owen. It's great to see you again. Great, great to see you. Great to have you back on. Um, we, yeah, it was a pleasure having you on last year. Um, one thing that, that is new as of, uh, as of this year is you're up for a uh, congressional gold medal. What would that recognition mean to you? Wow. It would mean a lot. Uh, it would mean it would be a, such an honor because... I don't think there's been a woman athlete with the honor. And um, I like it when I can bring attention to women's sports and help others. And I hope this will be, you know, if this should happen, which I'm not counting on, I can tell you that. But if it should happen, then I hope many, many, many more women athletes who are so deserving would get it. So just get it started. It was the same thing with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I was the first woman athlete. Uh, President Obama gave it to me in uh, 2009, which was the first year of his presidency. Uh, and I, I couldn't believe I was the first then. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I've known so many great ones. I mean, Althea Gibson, for instance, was one of my uh, sheroes. And I mean, she should have had it. She was the first black uh, man or woman to win a major in tennis. And I'm like, oh, I, I just can't believe how many. And, it's not about sports. It's not about just sports. It's what you do um, off the field or court or pool or out of the pool anyway or whatever than what you do when you're just performing. And I think people get confused. With men athletes, a lot of times they just get it because they're a great athlete in their sport. But usually a woman has to do a little bit more than that somehow. Yeah. And do you see that as – and just having a, a, another conversation around this where – 
because um, fighting for equity and recognition um, is just so integrated into to women's sports in a way that it's not for men? Uh, I think it has been. I, I looked at the um, Jesse Owens last night, 1936 Olympics on history, and I love that. See, I love all that. And I, I had the privilege of meeting him, you know, many, many decades ago. And I remember how much my dad admired him because my older, obviously, but he did so much for civil rights too, but he wasn't welcomed that much. When he, he was welcomed for like three days when he got home, had a ticker tape parade, then it was back to normal. You can't check in here. They treated him very poorly. So it's like we have to keep being good to each other and treat others the way we need to, to do and the way they want to be treated, not just, you know, how we're always taught treat others the way you want to be treated. No, treat others the way they need to be treated because they come from different cultures, different backgrounds, and certain things are very important. Like you can't shake hands with certain people. You know, you just don't do it, um, even though you would. I mean, I would. So you got, it's being thoughtful of others and their customs and what's important to them. But when Jesse Owens got back to the United States after going through hell in 1936, and then also there were two track um, guys that were Jewish that weren't allowed to run at the last second. It was Marty Glickman was one of them who I met years ago. In fact, the first sports radio show I did in New York was with Marty Glickman. And then the, I forget uh, the name. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to memorize it, the name of the other guy. And that was the last second when they did that. And then Jesse and Metcalf was the other guy's name. He, he, they filled in for the, the relay. And I, I mean, it's just, you can't believe it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, civil rights get get tied up in sports just because, you know, of course, it's always a reflection of the culture, even if you if you don't want it to be. And do you think it's it's an achievement when we are just focused on the sports? When we say, you know, you get the medal because you were just amazing at at the sport, and we don't even know what you did off the field, off the court. Is that a goal to get to, or or is or or not really? I think it's great that we have a platform. I know when I was twelve years old. I really thought about, you know, champion equality, but I also knew tennis was a global sport because I love history. So I knew it's played all over the world and I knew that that gave me an opportunity. I didn't know the word platform at 12, but that's what I was visualizing. And no, I think, I think it's, it's what you are as a human being as well. It's like Willie Mays who just passed is probably the greatest baseball player. And I knew Willie and, and my brother who played for the San Francisco Giants met Willie and Willie uh, went and got Randy and his two roommates, uh, other players. And I think Gary Matthews is one and some other player. Um, he, he asked them if they needed anything. He's always asking kids on the block. He's asking ball players. And Randy was a rookie, just come up to the Giants. And he goes, you know, do you need anything? No, I'm fine. And Randy said, no, I'm fine. Next day, there's a baseball mitt on right next to his locker uh, because he noticed Randy needed a new one. And then he got a television set, you know, for the three guys that were rooming together. And that's just the way Willie Mays was. So it's not just what he was on the field. It's also what he did off the field as a human being. So I think the whole person is very important, no matter who it is or what uh, form of entertainment or work or whatever we do. I mean, I could probably start asking you questions, what you do away from your work. And then you probably give back too. So um, do you have a favorite thing? Sure. Yeah, I, I'd say my my two main ones are, I mean, climate change and sort of protecting. You know, I donate to causes that buy up rainforest land. Oh, that's and, great. Um, you know, just you know, leave it alone. Um, and, and I'm also um, um, I've been pretty focused, especially in, in years past, on uh, just giving cash directly to um, uh, you know, oh, to families, to people that um, you in poorer parts of the world and just, you know, trusting them that they know what they need and a very direct, efficient way of helping them is, is uh, just through direct cash. Um, and it's been shown to, you know, through research that it's, it's quite effective uh, in terms of helping people. Um, so, so yeah. And yeah, right. This is, this is my job. I, I talk to, to people like you, to athletes, to media folks, to executives, and uh, I take a, you know, tiny little slice of that. And I know it, most of us are, multifaceted we're not just one way corrigan and uh, a wrong way corrigan <laughs> and uh it's it's great it's so uh, wonderful what you do to help others 
to to bring this back to the world of sports um you know so we've got two women's leagues that are making huge strides right now i'm referring to the nwsl and the wnba you know with um the the, the NWSL has a big media rights deal that that just kicked in this year. WNBA is on the horizon, um, and, and yeah, that that same sort of like wholeness of yes, this is sports. We want you to care about the sports, but also there there is sort of a bigger cause in inextricably kind of wrapped up into these leagues. Um, I, I'm just wondering what you think about their their growth and um, how they're forwarding this the same sort of progress and. Um, because with them, it, it does kind of feel like the the bigger they get, the more we're just focusing on the best teams, the best players. And that does feel like a certain type of progress. Um, at the same time, it's still very much wrapped up in this conversation of women's sports, the rise of women's sports, all of that. Well, I love it. I've waited my whole life for this. This is one of, one of my dreams. And for me to see the leagues, basketball was my first sport that I played. My dad was a basketball person. I couldn't play uh, baseball because of my gender. I realized that at nine. Thank God my brother got to play, it was good. He made it. Making it is not, everybody, oh, you played major league baseball. Well, the whole road to making it was very interesting to be a part of, just watching what Randy went through as a boy. But he always used to say to me, it's amazing how much harder your life has been than mine. All I have to do is show up at the bus at 5.30 and they take care of me. They take care of my uniform. I don't have to do anything. My, my, everything's done. You have to do everything. You, you know, I used to have to get everything organized. Not now. Now I'm totally taken care of. But um, it's, it is a cause in a way because we're trying to create a level playing field. And we are a microcosm of society. We make so much less money. To give you an idea this year, at the end of the year, I think the men will be at men's sports will be around 83 billion and we're hoping to make our first 1 billion by the end of the year in uh, women's pro sports. So you can see we have a long way to go, but it's really a reflection on women around the world. We don't make as much money. We're, we're in poverty a lot more uh, than men. Uh, so we're part of really leveling the playing field over time in society, in civilization. Uh, throughout the world. I mean, it's going to take, you know, everybody keeps changing it, but I think it's going to take hundreds of years to get equal um, prize, not prize money, equal salary, equal whatever. And we just don't, especially women of color and people living with disabilities. So um, we have a long way to go. It's rough. Once again, you're involved with Parity Week with, with Gainbridge. Tell me about your involvement there. Gainbridge has been fantastic and, and parity to women's sports. They're at 47% of sponsorship now. So when they have men and women, it's almost 50-50 now. And that's what I ask every company. Do you give as much to women's sports as you do to men's sports? And when we start doing that with sponsorship and other things and ownerships and all that, um, it really makes a difference. And under G Gainbridge, we have the Billie Jean King Cup, which is, which is the World Cup of Women's Tennis which is all over the world. You have the Annika LPGA where they give a ton of, I think they do equal money with the men actually in some ways. And then you've got Caitlin Clark as our newest member um, who signed up and obviously the Indiana Fever because they play at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. It's a total yes. And I love what they do. And, and actually Gamebridge Parity and the Women's Sports Foundation, which I founded, I founded the Women's Sports Foundation 50 years ago in our 50th anniversary. The three of us together are going to give away $150,000 in grants to deserving organizations um, and athletes that support girls and women through sports or education or both. So it's um, pretty exciting that we're going to do that. But I, I'm so thankful to, to Gainbridge and Parity, you know, and Dan and Bill, Dan Towers and Bill Sheldon and all these people because without them being behind us and Cassidy, uh, also, Taurus. There's people that are really making a difference. But uh, the, what's really changed on the most in the last even two years is that people are investing in women's sports instead of thinking of it as a charity, just helping us out. It's a real investment. They, they expect a return on their investment. Like um, you and I were talking before we started. Um, about 
difference. Like we started this ice hockey league, PWHL. Well, that's because of a person, you know, Mark Walter, who decided he was going to invest. And I say invest, not just help us out. It did help us out, but he expects return on his investment. And uh, so anyway, anybody that wants to get in on the thing I've talked about with the, with the women's sports and the game bridge and parody, I guess the, you probably have this. It's parody now dot uh, company or CO slash parody week all of, all together. Parody now dot O slash parody week. If people want to apply because the applications uh, close on July one and we want to make sure that the different people that might, deserve this money these organizations that we get it to them you know it used to be you know a charity thing just like you're saying it used to be a charity thing and now it's you know for the same reason they invest in steph curry and you know shohei otani and you know they just um they, they, they want to be you know in the shot they want to be where the center of attention is and women's sports are moving more into that um so oh, can can you just when, when you make that pitch to companies is it purely around um, invest because it's a good investment or, or is there sort of more also that component of this is the right thing to do? It's both, but uh, we've been going to CEOs forever. And I can tell you when they say to us, I just want quality it means they're not going to change. That's their kind of their line, the, the CEOs. So that's not happening anymore. Now they're thinking about what can I do to make a difference. There's different uh, people who are getting behind women. Clark has done uh, with the difference in the people watching. I mean, she's she's moving the needle. Anytime she goes, she's creating more business for everyone and great for the players. That's why I want the players to always help each other out. Uh, we know basketball is very, very influenced with blacks. They have been through the years. Bill Russell is one of my all-time favorites. And now you've got uh, so many great um, women of color playing, which I love, you know. And I, I think that it's important to really stand by each other. I know in uh, go back to 1971 when Chris Everett was 16 at the U.S. Open, um, we've been working hard to get a pro tour started. It was our first year. Chris wouldn't play, but her dad didn't let her play. It wasn't Chris. Chris still apologizes to this day. I keep going, don't worry about it. But she changed everything. The crowds were sold out because of her. The, Billy Talbert, the tournament director, came to me and said, I can't believe this phenomenon. What's going on? I got to put her on stadium court every time. I said, I hope so. But the players were upset because she was getting all this attention. And so I had a meeting. I said, you guys got to stop this. First of all, we're older. We have to be welcoming to the young players who are coming on tour. We're also the leader in professional women's sports. The LPGA did start in 1950, but we went ahead of them, like, I think in one or two years, way ahead. And the point was, let's figure this out. Go kill each other on the court. That's fine. But that's off the court? No. We have to be good to each other and really, really push each other. Um, so that was, I remember that day so clearly. Um, but the players, I must say, they responded. Everything was good after that. But, man, was it tense. It was so tense for a while. And I saw that, you know, with uh, Angel Reese and, and Caitlin Clark getting into it. Um, and I thought, oh, boy, this is good and bad. Because you know, these conflicts actually create interest. I mean, if you look at. Magic Johnson, Larry Bird back in the old days and when, when the NBA started to go in the right direction, they're the two players, but the real person that made the difference uh, was David Stern. He was a marketing genius, unbelievable guy. And I remember sitting at the U.S. Open tennis with him because he loved tennis. He played all the time. And I asked him one thing. I said, can I ask you? And he goes, ask me anything. You know, we're sitting next to each other. And I said, you have to promise me you will not let the WNBA fail. Because, you know, we've had other basketball leagues, and it always happens in men's and women's sports. You have a few leagues that, that try, they sputter, they don't make it. You keep learning from the experience. You know, and every one of these stepping stones are important. But when they started the, the WNBA, and I've been with the WBL, I mean, I've gone to meetings. I've been going to games. I, I own a college. 
Donna Orander, the she became commissioner later of the W. But she was playing. I mean, I've been, I've been there. I'm old. I've got perspective. So anyway, it's like he he looked at me and I said, "You got to promise me you will not let the WNBA fail." And he looked at me. He says, "I promise." Whew, I did an exhale. But look how hard it's been, you know. And the owners of the NBA got rid of them as fast as they could. They were allowed to whatever how whatever arrangement they made. So I knew it was going to be tough. It's still tough, and it's going to. It takes time. It takes. And it takes money. You have to find the money, or to, you can have all these great ideas, but if you don't have the money, you can't make it happen. The same with us back in the old days. You know, we got Philip Morris, and that's a whole other issue we had to deal with tobacco, because I didn't smoke, you know, or drink. I said we can't do that. And, well, Gladys Hellman, who we'd signed our one dollar contract with, said, "Well, that's who I got, and it's the best I can do." And I, she said, "What are you going to do?" And I said, "I hear you. You own me anyway. I signed the contract." But that's how we made it. So it's like. It's rough. It's not that easy. It's not. It's not easy. It's not a black and white situation. You are a founding partner of the the PWHL, the Hockey League, and you know they just had their first season. So I'm wondering your thoughts on that season. What's it going to take? Do you think it can like speed up that trajectory at all? Given that we're in a different culture, or or is it still going to you know be like a 20 year thing before it like really launches? That'll take time, but it has speeded up. That's what you're noticing. It's going faster than it did, which is so important. But it's um, with the PWHL, we did probably five years better than we thought we would. We're probably five years ahead of where we anticipated. And it's amazing how quickly they got it organized. I mean, last August, uh, Dan Caston and Royce Cohen and all of us, um, they went out and, you know, hired 150 people very quickly. Instead of waiting until November to start this November, we started January 1 was our first game. Um, Ilana and I, Ilana is my spouse and she does, she, she's the CEO of our company and, uh, PJ, BJKE and, and she and I were on a cruise and we'd for, we'd have, we were organized around this cruise and our 10 other friends like a year and a half ago. And then they said, well, the first game's January 1st. And we're going, oh no, we're going to be on the cruise. Ah. So we got off the cruise, went to the game, came back to the cruise. It was like, we're so exhausted, but it was worth it. Sold out crowds were on a, we, it was, it sold out so many times. Um, and we had three teams in Canada, three teams in the U S you know, we, we had Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto, and we had New York, Boston, and Minnesota. Minnesota is a real hockey place. They were getting 13, 14,000. Um, amazing. And then it got down to the last game. It went the full distance, three out of five in the playoffs. Minnesota who was number four out of six in the league. Um, barely got to the playoffs, ended up winning and beating Boston um, in the final game. So they won the playoffs by three games to two. And it was so tight, but it was so exciting because when you have sellout crowds, you have everyone, a lot of people crying. You've got signs that say, thank you for giving me my dream because that's what makes me tick. What makes me really tick is when I can help create opportunities and dreams for others. That's when I feel the best. I feel like we've connected. We've created a lot for the next generations. And you cannot believe the families, the fathers would come up to me and the mothers, particularly the fathers, because they always play together in hockey. It's a very family sport. The thing that we have to do is get more girls of color. I told them I would not help them unless we also, on the other side, at the grassroots level, get a lot more girls of color. Billie Jean King, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. To be continued. That's it for today. Please share this episode with a friend you think might be interested in it and tell them to subscribe while you're at it. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you on Monday.